Okay, so we've gone through getting into the host. We've gone through attaching and colonizing. And um, now we're going to talk about damaging the host. So 18.4, we're going to talk about a couple different mechanisms. There are nine basic cellular targets that bacterial toxins tend to target. We'll talk briefly about each of those, but we're going to focus primarily on two toxins, staphylococcal uh, alpha toxin and the cholera toxin, which we've talked about previously, so we're going to come back to that one. We'll talk about endotoxins and exotoxins. These are two different things. And then we'll talk a lot about the secretion systems pathogens use to get their exotoxins outside of the cell and to host cells. And we'll talk about the evolutionary relationship where these systems come from, because they're actually derived from other things we've talked about, but evolution has just modified them slightly. So in this chapter, we're talking about host damage. And I want to reiterate that microbes don't just damage hosts for the fun of it, right? They do this for specific reasons. Uh, it could be to evade the immune system. So they might destroy the immune system to evade it. It could be to gather nutrients. There are a lot of microbial toxins that lead to destruction of cells. The bacteria in turn will then suck up all those nutrients that are released in this process. And then there are cases where it helps transmission. So things like diarrheal disease, um, the diarrhea itself is a transmission mode. So that can help dispersal of the microbe. So let's look at a case study here. We have Will. Uh, He's a normal five-year-old. He's normally very active, rambunctious, but for the past two weeks, he's had a severe cough. And this started pretty normally, right? Runny nose, dry cough, uh, low-grade fever. So, you know, it could be anything at that point, right? But as time went on, the coughing fits would get longer and longer, and they could last up to a full minute. So he's coughing for an entire minute, uh... If you want to figure out how long that is, just sit there for a minute thinking about that. It's going to be real long. And what happens in these long coughing fits is he can't breathe between coughs. So he actually starts to turn blue. Uh, this is called becoming cyanotic. Um, and this is concerning, right? You're turning blue because you're not getting enough oxygen. And when he is able to breathe after these coughing fits... Uh, the nurse practitioner notices the uh, kind of ear-piercing whooping sound that comes with whooping cough. Um, this disease is highly contagious, particularly in the early stages. The nurse practitioner comes back, has a mask on now, trying to avoid uh, spread of whooping cough. And they take a nasopharyngeal swab, which I think we're all too familiar with now, because the bacteria, in this case, Portatella pertussis, uh, often resides in the deeper parts of the nasal cavity. They're also going to prescribe an antibiotic right now. Now you might say, but we don't know for sure that this is Bordetella pertussis. Well, the whooping and generally what's going on in the surrounding environment, usually when you have whooping cough, you have outbreaks. So they've probably seen that many other people have whooping cough. So to stop the spread, we prescribe antibiotics, even though it can take a long time for us to actually grow the organism. It can take 5 to 12 days um, to grow Bordetella pertussis. Uh, it also, it's very hard to find later in the disease. So we can use a more rapid test where we take blood and look for anti Bordetella pertussis antibodies in there. So uh, we can look for that a little bit quicker. Obviously... The serum test is positive, and in this case, we end eventually grew it. Hopefully, by the time we could actually grow it, uh, the child is healthy uh, now that the antibiotics have kicked in. So what's actually happening here? Why is Bordetella pertussis causing this disease? We have talked before about how the immune system causes some of the symptoms that we feel when we're sick. Inflammation, um, nausea, fever... These things are all from the immune system, um, and they they tend to not cause damage to the host. They can cause some, particularly like long-term inflammation, but they're mainly not harming the host. They're efforts to uh, destroy the microbe. 
in this case study, Bordetella pertussis is actually making a toxin, which will disrupt cell-to-cell -cell communication that helps the pathogen survive and reproduce in the respiratory tract. That toxin is leading to that coughing because there's high amounts of um, bacterial growth and things like that. This would be an example of an exotoxin. Uh, these are proteins that are secreted outside of the cells. They're gonna do things to host cells. They're gonna alter their function. They might disrupt the immune system. They might even kill the host cell. There's another type of toxin that gram-negative bacteria have called endotoxins, um, which hyperactivate the host immune system uh, to dangerous levels. We'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, so the pertussis protein, the toxin, is disrupting the lung cells and things like that, leading to those coughing fits. There are several places that exotoxins can act. So here we have a host cell, and we'll look at some of these. Um, it's not critical that you know all of these. I just want to mention some things. It might pique your interest. You might recognize some of these uh, bacteria here. So um, you've probably heard of this one, Staphylococcus aureus. Um, MRSA um, is a methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Staph aureus can make a toxin called alpha toxin, which actually disrupts and punches holes in the cell membrane of host cells, and they will die because of this, and the nutrients in the cell will leak out. There are other microbes that can uh, screw with the cytoskeleton of the cell. We talked about um, salmonella using the um, cytoskeleton to kind of move around throughout the cell. So they can mess with these um, tracks and cell shape. We'll see a couple examples in a moment. Uh, disrupting protein synthesis. Uh, diphtheria toxin does this. Pseudomonas aeruginosa toxin does this. Uh, this... If you disrupt protein synthesis, you're going to probably disrupt uh, antibody production, but also other signals and things like that, all to um, mess with the immune system. Stimulating or stopping cell division. So there are some bacteria that will basically uh, restrict cell division of uh, immune cells. There are other microbes, not just bacteria, that once they get into a cell, uh, if they promote cell division, the microbe divides along with it. Um, we will see viruses like this. HPV is one of these that actually promotes cell division. That can lead to cancer, ultimately. This broad one called signal transduction. This is a mechanism for cells to talk with one another and send signals. So signals are received on the outside of the cell, and they cause something to happen inside of the cell. There are many things that happen here. Uh, Bordetella uh, does, it, it affects this. Um, our cholera toxin, we'll see, messes with this. E. coli um, toxins can do this. There are other uh, mechanisms where they break apart cell-cell adhesion. So normally cells stick together. We talked about the intestinal cells. The intestinal cells are very tightly joined together, right? That keeps things from getting between them. Some microbes actually um, break apart the joints between cells that can help them infiltrate into the body. Um, messing with vesicles. We saw um, examples of this from intracellular pathogens in the previous section. And then blocking exocytosis. So we talked about Clostridium botulinum, Botox, that actually prevents neurotransmitters um, from being released properly and can lead to um, paralysis because of that. We will talk in just a moment about uh, another mechanism that can happen with endotoxins, which is excessive activation of the immune system. So let's talk about a basic way that exotoxins might work. Uh, this is a standard exotoxin um, example. We'll see an example of it in a moment, but uh, it's a two-part toxin. It's made up of protein. The A part is the actual toxic piece of this. The B subunits help it bind to the host cell. So on your cell, there's all kinds of receptors that are looking for signals, like the signal to divide or the signal to receive hormones or things like this. 
microbes will evolve these B components that will look like the signal that the receptor is looking for. In this case, the receptor binds that B part and releases A. Uh, the A part can do many things. One example is this ADP ribosal transferase. It's a big word for moving this ribosal unit onto something. So here we have a protein, right, that is active, that, that's something in the cell. If we take this very large uh, ribosal unit and stick it onto the side of the protein, that inactivates the protein. Remember, proteins are all about shape. If you glom large things onto them, they tend to not work right. So uh, this uh, is deactivating this target protein. Uh, what that target protein is depends on what the toxin is. Um, in diphtheria, this is a critical protein for protein synthesis. Uh, we'll see another example in just a moment with the cholera toxin. Okay, so that's one way exotoxins could work. Here's another way. I mentioned Staphylococcus, uh, common skin bacteria. Staphylococcus aureus can make a protein called the alpha toxin. The alpha toxin is basically a tube that can be inserted into the cell membrane of the host cell and that causes the cell contents to leak out and the cell lyses and dies. This is useful to the bacteria because there's lots of nutrients inside of cells and when they burst apart or are leaked out, the bacteria can scoop up those nutrients. So the alpha toxin is just a, a, a big tube that punches a hole in the membrane. We can actually test for this when we test for something called hemolysis. So this process, um, if it's destroying red blood cells, is called hemolysis. Uh, here you can see a blood agar plate. These, uh, this red bit is whole red blood cells that are in the media. Wherever we see streaks of bacteria, you will notice these kind of white halos around them. That is because the bacteria are secreting the alpha toxin out and it's punching holes in the red blood cells, causing them to leak the hemoglobin out and they no longer are red because of that. So this is one example of hemolysis. There are some other types of hemolysis that are used as standard uh, microbial identification tests. We'll talk about those in chapter 25. Okay. I said uh, we would come back to it again. We're going to talk about uh, the cholera toxin, but we're also the similar mechanism happens in E. coli. So here's our intestine, right? We have all these little villi, little finger-like projections that increase the surface area and absorb nutrients. So uh, the intestinal lumen, like stuff, goes through it, and uh, the villi absorb those nutrients. Things like sugars and ions, sodium chloride, water, all goes through. What happens in E. coli when it has um, a common toxin that can cause what we call traveler's diarrhea um, is it incorrectly signals to the cell to open chloride channels. You probably remember this from, wait for it, <laughs> the cholera example, right? You thought you were done with it. No, we're back to it. So remember, we talked about the cholera example Um we have ions moving out of the intestinal cells into the lumen that's going to draw water out, which leads to diarrhea. That diarrhea is really critical in dispersing the bacteria, right? Because that diarrhea can go out and contaminate more water. People drink that, completes the fecal oral route. So what happens? Well, here's the toxin, the cholera toxin. It's an AB toxin, and it has that ADP ribosal transferase bit. So the B subunit actually binds to a receptor on intestinal cells. So it binds this GM1 molecule and tricks the cell into bringing it in. So the B part binds to the receptors and it gets brought in by endocytosis. It travels to the endoplasmic reticulum where the A part pops off, the active part here. That travels back to the membrane and uh, interacts with a group of proteins called G proteins, which get switched on actually in this case. So instead of inactivating them, the A protein switches them on. And that leads to chloride ion channels opening. Chloride moves out. It has a negative charge, so it pulls with it sodium and potassium positively charged ions. 
all of those ions go into the intestinal lumen. And if you remember back to our osmosis section, because there's high concentration here, the water is going to try to move out to lower that concentration, leading to diarrhea. Okay, so I promised it would come all the way back. Now we know exactly how it's working. Um, this is just one of many, many different exotoxins. There are many exotoxins. And the scary thing is, is this system can be shared, right? It can be shared between different types of bacteria. So I'd be willing to bet that the uh, pathogenic E. coli has some sort of um, related protein to the cholera one. And maybe they've been shared by horizontal gene transfer. Okay, so those were exotoxins, proteins that are made by both gram positives and gram negatives. We're going to talk about something that only gram negatives have now called endotoxins. And in this case, uh, we're talking about that outside bit of the cell wall, the lipopolysaccharide, which is uh, a type of lipid that also has sugar attached to it. And there's a specific part of it that when it gets released, it overstimulates uh, the immune system. So... When a gram-negative bacteria dies, it kind of breaks apart, releasing this uh, this part of the LPS. That goes and binds with toll-like receptors. Remember, those were looking for uh, microbial-associated molecular patterns. But there's so much of this LPS released that it actually overstimulates the immune response. So high fever, activation of clotting factors, Activation of complement, vasodilation, and in uh, worst case scenario, shock and death can occur. So you might say, well, okay, so uh, if I have a gram-negative infection, maybe I shouldn't take antibiotics to kill it. Well, unfortunately, that's not generally an option because uh, you're more likely to die of the bacterial infection than you are from uh, this uh, endotoxin. But... It is something to be aware of when someone has a very large gram-negative infection. If we treat them with antibiotics, we have to be watchful for this uh, endotoxin reaction to occur. Uh, generally, that's safer than keeping the bacteria around, though. So uh, it's a calculated risk at that point. Okay, so when we talked about exotoxins... Um, I didn't mention anything about how the bacteria actually get them outside of bacterial cells. Uh, in gram positives, it's generally pretty easy because the membrane's right there. They can just release them uh, through that. In gram negatives, they have a double membrane system. So that makes getting it out there a little bit harder. But um, there are two strategies here. One is just make massive amounts of this protein toxin and secrete it into the extracellular environment and hope that it goes to its target cell. Uh, that's very wishful thinking, right? And you probably need to make a lot of extra toxin for that to occur. So uh, this is not the most efficient strategy at getting the toxin to the target cells. We will see that there is a specific protein uh, secretion system that is much more efficient at doing this. We know of nine different secretion systems. Um, we're going to talk about three of them. These are really interesting because, of course, they're how the exotoxins get outside. So maybe we could target them to treat microbial diseases blocking the exit of these exotoxins. Also, they're kind of interesting um, just in general to figure out how bacteria excrete um, different proteins or secrete, I guess is a better term. Um, because we could use that industrially. Remember, we used those um, E. coli to make the protein for insulin. Uh, well, if we could get it outside the cell, we could purify it much easier. If we could just remove the E. coli and get the, the insulin rate right out of the liquid. We're going to talk about three types of secretion systems. Type 2, type 3, and type 4. Very boring names, but... The interesting thing is we will see that each of these systems is related to another structure that we've talked about before. I'm talking evolutionarily related. So the genes that make up something like a pilus um, or a flagella have been modified to make a protein secretion system. This uh, is an example of um, 
Paralogy, um, these are called paralogs. The genes that are related to each other are called paralogs. Um, there's whole fields that study this, evolutionary relatedness of protein families and things. Fascinating topic, I love it. Um, we're gonna just briefly touch on how it's working here. So type two are related to pili, type three are related to flagelli, and uh, type four are actually related to the conjugation machinery. Um, so, Let's dive right into it. Type 2 secretion systems. This one is pretty cool, I think. So here we are, gram-negative bacteria. Double membrane here, right? Inner membrane, outer membrane, outside the cell. The protein gets made inside the cell. And generally, uh, there's just pores that allow it to move into what we call the periplasm, the space between the two membranes. But then it needs to get outside the outer membrane, which is much tighter to restrict what comes and goes. Type 2 secretion systems are related to those pili that we talked about. Remember the grappling hook ones that extend and then contract to pull the bacteria along? Well, here we have a piston that can extend and push the molecules outside the cell, and then it will retract back inside. And this is useful because it's like a pump. We can take lots of these uh, molecules and pump them outside to very, very high concentrations because we're relying on it traveling and dispersing to the cells that we're targeting. Um, so this isn't the most efficient secretion system, right? Because you have to make excess toxin, but you're able to pump it at high concentrations outside the cell. Okay, so that's type two. My favorite is type three. This one is related to flagella. So if you remember back, I showed you an electron micrograph of a flagella. It's got this little base and this rotor here, and then a flagella comes off of it and spins. So this looks exactly like it, but it is not a flagella. Instead, what it is, is basically a tiny hypodermic needle or syringe that the bacteria can use to directly inject the toxin into the host cell. So in this case, it's super efficient, right? You have protein toxin that's made, it gets loaded into this little needle and that punctures the host cell and directly injects the toxin in there. I think that's like amazing, um, That that's incredible that this has evolved and it, that it's related to flagella is just even more incredible. So this is a super efficient way at getting exotoxins into the host cell. Here's some examples of it in action. Shigella bacteria uses this type 3 secretion system to inject molecules into a cell, which then lead to the cell rearranging and actually bringing the uh, Shigella into the cell. Here we have E. coli, which have used a type 3 system to actually rearrange the cell membrane of the host cell to create these little pedestals that they attach to and live on. Um, this is probably in the intestines. So uh, this is pretty incredible, right? The bacteria is actually rearranging and, and instructing the human cell what to do. Okay, sorry to let you down. Type four secretion systems, not quite as cool as the hypodermic needle. Uh, these are related to the bacterial conjugation where we were transferring DNA from one microbe to another. Um, these are basically just a tube. <laughs> so it's a tube from the inner membrane to the outer membrane that uh, our toxin proteins can be secreted out of. Uh, Bordetella pertussis, the whooping cough bacteria, uses this system to export its toxins. All right, so let's tie it all together, right? We have salmonella. Salmonella uses a type three system. So it's outside the cell. It comes up to the cell membrane and punches that hypodermic needle through and it injects a bunch of proteins. These are gonna do different things. Some of the proteins tell actin to rearrange and basically engulf the salmonella, bringing it into the cell. Other proteins are gonna go talk to uh, the host cell genome and actually change the cytokines that get made. Um, so there's uh, lots of different things that are occurring here. Um, it can cause inflammation that leads to diarrhea, which leads to this being spread. Um, it uh, is using like 13 different toxin proteins in here. So a whole bunch of different things. Um, 
And of course, this gets taken in a vacuole and it stops phagocytosis, um, lysosome fusing from occurring so it can live inside the cell. All through that little needle injector there. All right. So we talked about lots of different mechanisms here. Uh, Staphylococcus aureus alpha toxin creating pores for hemolysis. The AB toxin example, um, particularly for the cholera example. I would love you to know that cholera example. That lipopolysaccharide is an endotoxin. Remember, um, when gram negatives die, they release that and can overstimulate the immune system. Um, and then we talked about the secretion systems. My favorite's type 3, the molecular syringe, but each is related to a different structure. Type 2 related to pili, uh, type 3 are related to flagella, and type 4 are related to the conjugation system. All right, that's it for 18.4.